Colorado. Yes, yes, my name is Dewan. Yes, I know that that's a boy's name. Yes, I'm fully aware. My name is still Dewan. My parents thought I was going to be a boy. Surprise. Uh, and they still wanted to name me um, after my Uncle Dwayne, and so that's where Dewan comes in. And so I, I get it all the time. That's a dude's name, I know, but I'm a lady, so look at God. Isn't he faithful? Right? Uh, but my name is Dewan. I'm a youth pastor in Denver. I have the honor of serving uh, the kids ages 12 to 17 in Denver. Um, and they're, they're like the youthy kids. We be doing all kind of crazy stuff. And so this just feels real good right now because it, it has the same type of vibe as my kids, and so th this is awesome. This is absolutely awesome. And, and you know, we just happen to share the same pastors. So let's go ahead and give it up for Pastor Torre, for Pastor Sarah in their absence. Thank you guys. I just wanna say thank you for sharing your pastors with us. We have been so incredibly blessed to have them in our house, to have them um, pastor over us. And because they're uh, your pastors and our pastors, then we're technically like cousins or something like that, right? So I'm just that cousin that your mom and them didn't tell you about. Hey, I, I'm coming over your house for dinner directly after service, so get ready, make sure your house is clean, because um, I'm coming, right? Close all the closets, get everything swept up, hurry up, run the vacuum real quick and then come open the door, right? I'm family, I'm so, so happy to be here. Super, super happy to be here. Uh, and so I do believe that God has given me a word um, for us. Something my dad taught me a long time ago before I even began preaching. He told me uh, the word first comes to the minister and then to the people. In other words, the same word that is gonna come um, out of my mouth from God, because Lord knows you don't want to hear nothing that comes just from me, hallelujah, that, that comes from the Lord out of my mouth to you, comes first to me. So if anything happens that hurts just a little bit, know it hurt me too when I heard it the first time, okay? Uh, so I want you to know that we're on the same page there. This is not me saying you need to get together. This is we need to get together. God help us all, amen, uh, amen. And so, so uh, I, I got this word probably two weeks ago. The Lord began talking to me about this particular word. And this was before I even knew I was coming here. The Lord began talking to me about this word. I had to preach in Denver uh, before I knew I even had to preach in Denver. Uh, I, I, was, I just had this word coming into my head. And I was like, oh, this is cool. This is a cool concept. And I wrote it down. Like a lot of you guys are like artists and stuff like that. So you know how it is. You get like a cool idea. You're like, oh, snap. Write it down, because you don't want to forget it, right? And so it's the same thing for me a lot of times when I'm preaching. I was like, oh, that's a cool idea, cool concept. And I got a call um, maybe two days or so after I got the initial idea. And I said, okay, that's cool. Maybe I'll preach that. And then I felt like the Lord was like, nah, not right now. So I was like, okay, I'll preach something else. And then that thought came to my head again, and I was like, Nah, that's not it. So I preached something else. And then the word came to my head again. And literally that same day that the word came to my head, I, I got uh, contact with Pastor Ture. And I said, apparently that's what I'm supposed to preach. And so I tried to fight this word because I was telling my husband, because I just preached in Denver yesterday. I was telling my husband, that word was good to me. We're going to preach that again right here in L.A. We're going to recycle and microwave that thing one more time because it was good. But... But I felt like the Lord was like, no, this is what I want you to preach. So I really want you to be receptive to what the Lord wants to say to us in this season. Amen. So if you would uh, just indulge me turning your Bibles to Genesis 32. Genesis 32. I'm going to go to verse 22. I'm new school, but I was raised old school. So as as old or as new as I'm going to get as new King James. I, I apologize if you like messenger NIV. I promise you, I'm so sorry. But I just, how I was raised was you got to read it from the King Jimmy or it ain't right. So uh, y'all ain't heard that before? Got to be King Jimmy. So uh, Genesis 32, verse 22. And we're going to read down to verse 28. Y'all don't know how excited I am. Usually I have a good 30 to 20 minutes at home. And I don't know if you can tell, I like to talk, so this is going to be good. I don't have to rush. This is, God is good. So uh, Genesis uh, 32, verse 22, it reads, And he arose that night and took his two wives. He is Jacob. Jacob arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons. 
and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. If we were going to give a, a title to this message, I would call it Twins. Now, if you like me and you've had a couple babies, don't let that scare you. I'm not saying prophetically you finna have twins. It's not what I'm saying. That's just the, the title of the message is Twins. Lord, bless this word, Father. God, bless this word. God, speak to us, your people. God, speak as only you can, God. You said the very entrance of your word brings light, God. So illuminate every dark place. God, move, God. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit be right here, right now, in this room. Speak to us. God, prick every heart, every mind. Transformation, God, may we never be the same, completely and totally transformed by your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So twins, 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 twins. Twins is this phenomenon that uh, everyone is still really interested in, if, if we think about it. Even though twins are a pretty common occurrence, especially for whatever reason in people of color. People of color are more likely to have twins. Not 100% sure as to why that is, but it is is quite the phenomenon when people have twins, or now it's like quadruplets and sextuplets and octuplets and whatever the other tuplets are. People having multiple babies is like a big deal, and I can understand that because I have now had had two babies on my own and I used to think I wanted to have twins until I had two babies singularly and I recognized that it was painful and I said the devil is a liar we don't need no twins over here you can keep that over there Satan I don't want it like it, it was hard for me to carry one child right I had like big dinosaur babies but it was still difficult for me to carry those babies so I can imagine other turmoil of carrying two children in your womb at one time if you did that shout out to you kudos Kit Kats all of it like you are a G for real that's absolutely amazing uh, a twins twins is just this crazy phenomenon it has boggled people's minds and different historians and different scientists like forever even if we begin to look back in history in terms of like Anschutz and um, all these different places during the Holocaust there was a huge portion of people who were actually able to survive only because they were twins uh, they did all kinds of studies on them them, trying to see if they pricked one twin, if the other twin would feel it, um, if they cut one twin, if the other twin would feel the cut, um, if, if something happened to one twin, if the other twin would feel it. These, this, this, this infatuation with twins is something that has seemed to plague um, our culture as a whole. And then you begin to look at the Bible and you recognize that not only do twins seem to be something important um, just from a cultural standpoint, they also seem to be something important important to God. We begin to see twins um, throughout the Bible. This particular character that we're dealing with, Jacob, is himself a twin. He has a brother by the name of? Y'all better come on. Y'all went to Sunday school at least twice. Let's go. His, his brother's name is Esau. What's his brother's name? Let's go. His brother's name is Esau. They're twins. Uh, he happens to marry a young lady by the name of Rachel. Um, and, 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 and now, this now this is when it gets a little messy, Jerry Springer-ish, all right? So let me give you a little background on this story, okay? So my man Jacob has a twin brother by the name of Esau. Um, he comes to be because his mama is barren. She cannot have children. She begins to pray and cry out to God for him to give her a son, for him to give her 
her an heir, and in her crying and praying, God blesses her with twins, which should, should communicate at least this to us, that when we ask God for something, he never gives us just the minimum. He always gives us more than we could ever expect. So, so she was not just blessed in one way. Like, she was blessed twice over, and she had twins, right? Uh, and so she has Jacob, and she has Esau, and we know that, that, that they, they, they fight all up in the womb, like, while she's pregnant. This is why I can't have twins. While she was pregnant with them, they were fighting the entire time in the womb. Um, and when they're born, Jacob is holding on to his brother's heel, fighting, coming out. Like, Jacob is like a G for real. He is hood. Jacob is doing the most, okay? Jacob, Jacob and his brother Esau fight their entire life. Jacob is trying to figure out a way to get an upper hand over Esau because their relationship isn't all that good. Um, even though they're twins, they have all sorts of rivalry and conflict. And, and so at one point, Jacob disguises himself as Esau so that he can gain his brother's birthright from his father. And his father is old and blind, so he can't tell the difference. And he gives his brother his inheritance. He gives Jacob Esau's inheritance. And Jacob, uh, Jacob's name, by the way, it means trickster. Um, it means a conniving, twisted, manipulative type of dude, right? His mama saw him holding on to his heel, and his mama said, look at you. You a trickster, and you ain't right, and that's what we're going to call you, Jacob. Aren't you glad that your mama thought about you just a little bit? You said, mm, he a little ugly, but he going to grow into that face. We're going to make this thing work. I'm a name of Adonis, because, you know, she spoke faith into existence, right? But these old school mamas wasn't like that. She says, grabbing his hair, you're a trickster. She named him Jacob. And so, so she, he tricks uh, his father in, in, with help from his mama tricks his father, uh, goes over to his mother's brother, Laban, and, and decides that he wants, she want, he wants to get a wife from there. And he sees Rachel. And as soon as he saw old oh girl, he fell in love. He was like, oh, snap. This is the one for me. Jesus, do it. If you, you talking about, you know, love at first sight, this was love at first sight. Even the Bible said that Rachel was bad. And you know if the Bible say that you bad, like you bad, right? The Bible was like, she was good in form and figure. She was killing the game, right? And so he sees Rachel and he falls in love with her immediately. And so he's like, I'll do whatever it takes to get this girl right here. Let me stop right there real quick. Because ladies, if he's not willing to do whatever it takes to get you here, ain't worth your time or attention. Amen. Hallelujah. Turn up. Dude, you too. You too, man. I don't know how that spins in, but you too. I don't want to leave you out. So, uh. So he, he, he works to get Rachel and Laban being of the same lineage, that same trickster mess, that same foolishness, conniving, because it all runs in the family, right? All that trickster and conniving. He tricks Jacob and gives Jacob Leah. Now, the Bible, <laughs> the Bible sometimes, like, God be playing, right? They said Rachel was, was good in figure and everything. They said Leah had weak eyes. Now, <laughs> you can look at that whatever way you want to look at it, but I'm pretty sure God just dogged out Leah. He was like, Leah was struggling just a little bit. And so Laban, Laban, Laban against Jacob Leah. And, when ja and he gives Jacob Leah, and Jacob that night, he's so excited and giddy, he don't even recognize it ain't the girl that he just worked seven years for. And he go in there like, hey, and they get it on. He don't even know that it's not Rachel until the next morning. Can you imagine that? Some of y'all been there. Hallelujah. <laughs> he wake up the next morning, and he's like, oh, God, what are we going to do? And, and Laban says, don't worry, she's just the elder of the two. I'll give you Rachel. And so he, he takes Rachel, gets married to her. Time goes on. Rachel recognizes that she's barren. She can't have children. She gives uh, her handmaiden to him to go sleep with her so that she can produce an heir um, for her. And then Leah feels some, some type of way, and she gets salty. So she gives her handmaiden to Jacob, too. So at this point, Jacob got sister wives 
and his whole little clan, and, and, and stuff is crazy and it's tumultuous, and there's all of these, these sorts of twin-type situations that are occurring in his life that are dichotomies of sorts, that are good and bad, that are okay and not quite okay. Like, it's just a very, very interesting situation. And God himself, like we said before, he's, he's kind of interested in twins. Uh, we established that Jacob and Esau were twins, but according to Jewish tradition, Leah and Rachel were also twins. Um, then, then you begin to think all the way back to Cain and Abel, according to Jewish tradition. Cain and Abel were twins. Uh, you have people like Perez and, and Zeray, I think is the name, and they were twins. And if you go deep with me real quick, take two, two steps back and come forward. Okay. If you think about it, from the scientific standpoint of twins, let's, let's go to reproductive class in high school. There's one cell that cell splits, and from that one cell is created two beings. Okay, got that? Adam was one man, and from that one man was ripped out of Eve. And it was almost like they weren't twins, because that's weird, right? But, but it was almost like a twin situation. From this one whole thing uh, was divided two completely separate things. And, and so it, it begins to beg the question, how can there be two things existing in this one individual, this one person, this, this one person? How can there be two opinions, two different thought processes, two different ideologies, two different ways of doing things, and they all exist in this one person? And that, my friends, is the issue of... Jacob. Jacob has been wrestling and struggling and fighting his entire life. And if you're anything like Jacob, you have a little bit of color purple in you. In that all my life, I had to fight. Jacob has had to fight his entire life life. And when we get to this particular stance in the scripture, Jacob is tired. Jacob has been fighting his whole life. The scripture says it really nice. He has his two wives, his two maidservants, and his 11 sons, his four baby mamas, and his 11 kids between those four baby mamas are all traveling with him to go meet Esau, the dude that he did 30 years ago. And, and there are two pieces of him that have been in battle and in agony and in rage his entire life. No wonder he spent those 10 months in the womb wrestling with his brother. Is, is it possible that really, even in the womb, he was already wrestling with himself? Because there were these pieces inside of him that didn't seem to coincide. They, they didn't quite seem to fit. And we see Jacob right here at the edge of Jabbok. And he's tired and he's worn out and he's dealing with all these situationships trying to make things work y'all know what a situationship is let's go child support come out every month hallelujah we ain't all been saved forever hallelujah deliverance thank you God run through the room he finds himself at the brook of Jabbok. And so he sends over his two wives. Listen to this. He sends over his two wives. Two wives. <laughs> sends over his two maidservants, twin, twin. Sends over these dual issues. These, these dual problems, because there's issues with Rachel, and there's issues with Leah, and then there's issues with this maidservant, and there's issues with that maidservant, and if I make this one happy, then this one's upset, and if I make this one happy, then this one's mad, and there's all of these issues, and then it says it sends over his 11 sons. Now, I know from hermeneutical law that I cannot allow any small details to go unnoticed. I need to figure out why the Bible has made a conscious decision to say 2-2-11, uh, okay, because it couldn't just say Jacob and them, his people went over there and Jacob stayed over here. But it made, it made a point to tell me that it was 2, 2, and 11. Now, we know the 2 and the 2 are the twins, right? But 11, 11, 11, 11 means chaos. Let me tell you something. When, when you get mess plus mess on top of mess 
on top of more mess, all you're going to do is produce a baby, and that baby's name is chaos. And Jacob trying to fight against the demons within himself, against his own personality, what he wants to do, what he thinks he ought to have, fighting his entire life, all he's done is produce chaos. No wonder he's tired. Because he spent his whole life trying to fight for himself. And so here he is standing at the brook of Jabbok. Let's the twins pass over, if you will. The chaos pass over. And it's his turn. Jabbok means to pour out. Means to empty. It means to, to let go of. Now Jacob is getting ready to have one of the most incredible encounters to me in all of scripture. And I believe that there's some folks in here who have been praying and asking and seeking and desiring a real, authentic, raw, exceptional, over-the-top encounter with God. I'm talking about the type of encounter that changes everything, that, 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 just, that just, I mean, that just, just, just flourishes your whole city, that messes everything up. But I have to tell you, before that encounter can come, you too have to cross over your Shabbat. Jacob had to get to a point where he let all of that mess go. And unfortunately for Jacob, that didn't come until he got tired. And sometimes we're still having too much of a good time doing our dirt to let stuff go, and then we're asking God, why am I not feeling you? Why, 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 can't I, why can't I get in like I want to? And why am I not getting my breakthrough? And why aren't things working for me? Is it possible that we're too busy holding on to the twin pieces of our life that are so contradictory to what God has in store for us to begin with? What we have to do is begin to walk over and pass over our own personal jabbat and allow ourselves to be emptied of ourselves. God cannot fill us with himself when we're too full of ourselves. When we are too full of pride and we're too full of anger and we're too full of jealousy and we're too full of deceit and we're saying, God, do something. God, work on me. God, do that. And God's saying, well, if you get out of yourself and get out of my way, I might be able to do something for you. But as long as you're standing in the way of your own encounter and your own miracle, you will never get to what God has for you. We have to cross over our own personal jabbox, whatever that means for you. Maybe it's emptying yourself of that unforgiveness. Maybe it's emptying yourself of that deceit and then you know you like to lie. You know you got a problem. You know you need some help. Maybe it's emptying yourself of that. Maybe it's emptying yourself of your trifling ways. You over that boy's house every week, every night, and then you coming up here raising your hands like, God, it's okay. I'm going to make this thing work. And God is saying, baby, don't you know I want to do something incredible in your life? But I can't do it because you're standing in my way. What would happen if you begin to just empty yourself? So he crosses over Jabbok, emptying himself. And the scripture tells us a word that I think is great. It says that, and he was alone. We don't like being by ourselves. That's, that's not cool. I remember my mom, as you can see, I like to talk. Um, I'm one of five kids. I'm the fourth of five kids. Yeah, my parents, they was out here multiplying, fulfilling the earth. And so I'm one of five kids. And, 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 and my parents, my mom particularly, because I like to talk, she would make me sit alone and quiet. And I hated it. <laughs> now that I'm a parent, I understand. Because I've been, I've been trying to, we have a two-year-old son, and I try to convince him. I'm like, Carter, you don't even have to take a nap, man. Just go in your room and play with your toys. Just do it quietly. <laughs> and I got this lock from Target that costs $7. If you're a parent, I'm trying to tell you, I got the hookup. This lock from Target, because my son is smart. He can open any door. But this lock from Target, it will stop it all in his tracks, right? <laughs> I put that lock on that door. I'm like, just, just hang out. Just chill in the back room. Put that lock on. He loses his mind because he does not want to be in there by himself. And a lot of times what I learned even for myself in being by myself, a, a lot of the issue was being by myself, being alone mean that I had to face all that mess. 
And sometimes that's good. If you can't be honest with anybody else, you might as well be honest with yourself. Yeah, girl, you jacked up, girl. I know, we gotta work. You gotta be honest with yourself. And, and, and if we're being honest with ourselves, if, if we're talking about pouring things out, when, when I was a kid, my parents used to, if, if you grew up in the church, not the church, the house where you woke up on Sunday or Saturday morning and you heard like music, old school music, gospel music, hold my mule music, you knew you was gonna get up and clean, right? And it was like, depression just came over you. And you was like, loose here, devil, like you didn't know what to do. And I remember waking up and being like, oh, I wanna clean nothing today. Didn't we clean last week, mama? And so we thought that we could trick my mom, right? Like we thought my mom was dumb or something, I guess. And so she would say, y'all clean your room. And we would say, yes, yes, ma'am. She said, y'all clean y'all's room. Oh, you know I'ma clean my room, mama. You ain't even got to worry. She would leave. And I would take like all my clothes and toys and stuff them under the bed. <laughs> you too. You got whoopers too, didn't you? And then I would make the bed and make sure that the sheet hung over just so you could, come on now, just so you couldn't see what was underneath the bed. And, and my mom had this practice where she said, now if I come in that room and it ain't clean, you're going to get it. And I said, oh, you ain't got to worry. My room is clean. Because I didn't think she was going to find nothing, right? So she would come into the room and she said, now, Dewan, for everything that I found out of place, you're going to get a lick. Ain't going to be no licks in here. Ain't going to be no licks in here. I got it straight. Stuff is clean in my house. And, and my mom would come in. She'd be looking around. I'd be like, she don't even know to check under the bed. My, this thing is clean. And she'd be she'd be like, okay, everything looks good. Every, everything looks good. It looks like it's in its place. She would lift up that bed. Oh, fear trembling all of it. <laughs> Fall out. Because she'd start counting one, <laughs> two, three. And I'd be like, mama, 13. I'd be like, mama, mama. And I used to not understand why she would make us do all of this cleaning and put your winter clothes away and put, do this and put the hangers and get new hangers. And I'd be like, Mama, you are tripping. Just leave it out. Winter will come back. We live in Colorado. You never know what's going to happen. Like, just leave it out. And she, she would always say, no, no, no. We have, to, we have to switch things over because the season is changing. And if we allow all of these things to stay out in this season, we won't have room for what's coming in the next season. And what I'm telling you is, if you don't empty yourself of the mess that has held you down in this season, you will not have room for what God has for you in the season that is coming. You must allow yourself to be emptied of all the mess and the murk and the maya because God is doing something new in this season. And I don't want you to miss out on what he's doing in your church, in your city, in your home, in your family, in this season because you're too full of all last season stuff. Gotta put it all away. And so Jacob is left alone. And here comes the most incredible to me, one of the most incredible biblical stories that there is. And it says, and he began to wrestle a man. This is a theophany. What that means is, this is us seeing Jesus here in the Old Testament. So it says the angel of God, but this is a theophany. So, so we could basically say this is Jesus showing up in the Old Testament, right? And he shows up. Now, everywhere else I see in scripture, when you see an angel, angelic beings, the response is, oh God, I'm finna die. Help me. Don't kill me, Lord. If I see it, y'all be praying for angels. Listen, I see an angel show up right now, I'm probably going to be the first person out that door. I ain't going to be like, hallelujah. I'm going to be like, and we got to go, right? This is the city of angels. I don't want to see none, no. That's all right, Jesus. Let them be here, but I don't need to see them, right? Like, like Jacob does not have this response at all. Jacob's response is not worship. His response is not fear. His response is fight. His response immediately is fight. Because the thing is, when you've been through the ringer, and you've been through a whole bunch of stuff, your automatic response will always be to resort to what you know. And wrestling is all that Jacob knows. So he begins to wrestle with the only one who can give him what he's been wrestling for his entire life. 
but this is what I love. He begins wrestling with the angel of God. And the angel of God isn't like, stop. Leave me alone. You don't know who I am. I'm God. Smite you. Die. Like, he doesn't do none of that. He begins to fight right back. Like, isn't it good to know that you have a God who will fight for you, fight with you, go to the ringer with you, do whatever is necessary to get you to where he wants you to be? And he begins to fight with Jacob, and Jacob wrestles with him and wrestles with him because, you see, Jacob finally got to a place of desperation. And there's something about being desperate for God, being desperate for him, being desperate for his spirit, desperate for deliverance, desperate for healing. To God, I don't care how you do it. Any way you want to bless me. Any way you want to touch me. God, I don't care how it happens. I don't care who sees it. I don't care who knows. God, I'm desperate for you. Jacob finally gets to a place where he's desperate and he wrestles with all that he has. He wrestles. He wrestles until the scripture says the break of day. He wrestles. He wrestles. That's a long time. He wrestles. He, I'd be tired after, I'd be like, okay, I give up God. But he just kept, he kept, and that's, that's some of our problem. That's some of our problem. We don't want to go through the work. We don't want to go through the work of getting what God has for us. We think everything's supposed to be easy. Skip over here, skip to my loo, and I'm going to get what I'm supposed to get. But it's not like that. Some stuff you got to work through. Some stuff you got to wrestle for. Some stuff you got to cry for. Some stuff you got to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning for. Uh, these come but by prayer and fasting. Some stuff requires work, not just on God's part, but on your part. He worked and he worked and he wrestled and he wrestled and he finally had an opportunity to speak because this whole time we don't even hear Jacob say anything. And God says, the angel of the Lord says, let me go. And Jacob says, nah, I won't let you go until you bless my soul. What would happen? to our churches, to our schools, to our homes. If we didn't sit all day watching the clock, waiting for service to end, saying, God, I'm going to pray, but only for 22 minutes because the show's going to come on. And I got to watch this. And I, what would happen if we begin to take, I mean, wait as long as it took. We said, God, if it takes all night, if it takes three weeks, if it takes all morning, if it takes six years, God, whatever it takes to get my breakthrough, I'm willing to do it. God, it does not matter. Whatever it takes, what would happen if we did whatever it takes? Jacob wrestled. I will not let you go. I will not stop praying. I will not stop fasting. I will not stop worshiping. I won't stop doing the things that I'm doing until I see you move on my behalf. God, I don't care. I know I'm tired. I know I look a mess. I know I'm sweaty. I came cute and now I look a mess, but God, it don't matter. I won't do anything else until you touch me. And God finally gives Jacob what he has been wanting his entire life. His name. When you're a twin, there's an identity crisis generally. Uh, a lot of times it's hard for people to separate you from the other. Um, people have a really hard time identifying you um, from your twin. Now, I'm not a twin, uh, but I have a sister who apparently we look a lot alike. I don't see it. She cute, but I don't see it, right? No, for real, she cute. My sister is fly, for real. She's my older sister, and I love her to death, but mm, I don't see it, right? I just don't. I don't see, I don't see it. I mean, we, we resemble each other, but literally in high school, for example, um, we're, we're 22 months apart. So we are, she was in 11th grade, I was in 9th grade. So, and we went to the same school. So, for example, in high school, people would walk up to me not recognizing that I was not my sister. And they would say, you know, hey, Pam, her name is Pamela. 
hey, Pam, what are we going to do this weekend? I'd be like, hey, I'm not Pam. And so I got, I got the reputation of being like the mad twin, even though we weren't twins. Um, people, I would hear over here conversations, people being like, yeah, that one one, I don't know if one is really smart or one is really slow, because one's in 11th grade and one's in 9th, so I can't, I can't figure it out. Like, it was a problem. It literally got to the point where my sister and I used to dress alike all the time. It got to the point where she didn't want to dress like me, she didn't want her hair like me, um, and not because she didn't love me, not, not because she didn't think I was a great person, but because she wanted to separate herself. She wanted to have her own identity. Jacob has been holding the identity of his mother, the identity that his mother gave him his entire life. His entire life, he has been known as a trickster, as a deceiver, as an evil person. And I don't know the names that have been given to you uh, where people have told you, oh, you're always going to be a failure. Your mama was a dropout. You crazy. Your mama's crazy. Oh, y'all crazy. You're stupid. You've always been stupid. You're not going to make it. You're a failure. You can't do anything in life. But I'm here to tell you that on the other side of that wrestling, on the other side of that struggling, on the other side of that is a breakthrough that where God would allow you to recognize who he created you to be a long time ago before the foundation of the world God knew you you had a name before your mama named you you had a name before your mama met your daddy and even though it was a weird situation and y'all don't like each other today I'm telling you you had an identity all the way back then you had a purpose you had a call God wanted something he wanted to do something in your life and the enemy only wants to frustrate what God wanted to do in the first place his mama got it messed up and he dealt with it his entire life and finally, he stands with the only person who could call him who he's been his whole life. And so he turns to him and he says, what's your name? Isn't it funny that God who knows everything would ask me what my name is? What's your name? What's your name? And, and he, he mistakenly thought, oh, my name, my name is Jacob. Because he assumed that his actions were what named him. And I love the fact that God doesn't name us by our actions. Like, like, I'm weak, but he says I'm strong. Like, I be going through, but he says I'm more than a conqueror. I, I don't feel like I'm blessed, but he said I'm blessed coming in and blessed going out. He said that I am the head and not the tail. God calls those things that are not as though they are. So he does not call you by what you do. He calls you by who you are. And he says to him, you are Israel. You have fought your whole life, and you have finally conquered the demons that have been fighting you forever. I need you to know that in every Jacob in this room, there is an Israel. The thing that I wish I wouldn't do, I do. And the things that I don't want to do, I do. And there is this struggle within myself. And I say, woe is me. Who will deliver me from this body of death? But thanks be unto Jesus Christ who paid the price, who did everything for me to ensure that I would no longer have to fight against the warring sides of me and I could come to the place where I can recognize that Jacob might be alive, but it's Israel who's going to be in the first front and it's Israel who's going to take care of things. It's not ratchet me, it's new me who's going to get stuff done. I know cussing me used to come at you all crazy, but right now, saved and sanctified me is going to pray for you and help you out. I know that that crazy me used to go off on you and punch you in the face, but blessed and saved me is going to say, you know what? Not today, devil. I got you coming another way because I recognize that I wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, and therefore I'm going to speak the word of life and I'm going to call you out for who you are because God has already called me victorious. I am the head and not the tail. I am above and not beneath. God has greater for me. There might be two sides, but I'm telling you, they don't both win. My dad used to tell a story, and it went like this. There's two dogs sitting on a porch. My daddy is from Enid, Oklahoma, so he's just a little bit country. I love you, daddy. Um, two dogs 
two dogs on a porch. And a man comes up to the porch and he says, you got two dogs? You must know the story because you start laughing. You got two dogs. Two, you have to say it like that. Dogs. You got two dogs on your porch. And, and one is howling and the other is sitting in line dormant. What's, what's going on? And he said, well, I got two dogs. <laughs> one is howling and yapping and the other is sitting in line dormant. But what you have to understand is one I feed and one I don't. And when it comes to the two entities that exist within yourself, the duality that is you, if you ever want to overcome Jacob and be all that God has called you to be Israel, you have to determine which dog you're going to feed. Uh, which, which one are you going to allow to exist? Are you going to allow your spirit man to dwell? Your spirit man to have victory? Or are you going to put your Holy Ghost down and cuss homegirl out and give her her two cents and tell her, you don't know who I am. I go to one church LA. Beep, beep, beep. That don't match. That don't match. That don't match. And I'm telling you, I want us to be victorious. Gone with the day where people can look at Christians and say, I don't believe because your lifestyle doesn't match what you profess. We must be examples. And we must get the point where we begin to conquer that other side that lives on the inside of us. It does not die. If you begin to look through scripture, there are many times throughout scripture where, where scripture begins to call Israel Jacob again. Because Jacob done done some Jacob stuff. <laughs> and God said, no, that wasn't Israel. That was Jacob. <laughs> and then it turns right back around and it says, Israel did this. Jacob did this. Because the, the good thing is there was redemption in both. Because God can redeem Jacob in the same way that he's redeemed Israel. So there is redemption in both. So it's not death. It's not necessarily death to these things. Now, it is death to your flesh and death to what you want to do and what you think is right and how you feel. And Well, I don't want to do it right now, and I don't feel like praying. I don't care what you feel like. It's not a feeling. Christianity, this walk, who we are called to be is not a feeling. I don't feel like praying all the time, but I know that that's where my help comes from. That's where my strength comes from. I don't feel like raising my hands all the time because I had a long day, but after a while, when I begin to raise my hands, God begins to remind me of the things that he's brought me from and I can't help but say, thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. You delivered me. You brought me this far. You'll do it again. If you did it before, you'll do it again. Sometimes you have to remind yourself because your flesh will make you feel like he has forgotten you. So you got to remind yourself, no, 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 no. Back in 1992, I should have died and God helped me. Back in 78, I don't know if somebody in 78, but back in 78, God did it for me in 2004. I should have lost my life in 2000. And, this is true life right here. In 2010, I was going to take my life. True. I was going to take my life because Jacob had taken forefront in my life. And I could not understand because, you see, I had been a Christian. I got saved when I was 12 years old. My parents were pastors. My grandparents are pastors. My great-grandparents are pastors. My great, great, great grandparents are pastors. As far back as we know, at least four or five generations, they be just be preaching. You come to my family, ask my husband. When my husband proposed, they went in. You hear me? You're not coming to my family reunion and you ain't gonna get baptized at least one good time. Like, some, somebody's gonna lay you out at least once, right? Like, I came from all of this, and I found myself in a situation, and Jacob showed up, and I didn't know how to do with it because I had never experienced it before. And I said, how are people going to look at me? What are they going to say? What, what are they going to say when they recognize that Jacob and Israel are the same person? that they exist in the same body? What are they going to say when they see that I failed? What are they going to say? What are they going to say? And, and the, the devil was working, y'all. And I was about to take my life, but God. God began to remind me. He walked with me. He didn't leave me. 
We wrestled together. We wrestled. We wrestled until we got it right. Next thing I knew, 2012, I meet the man of, well, 2011. I meet the man of my dreams. I fall in love with him. We get married in 2012. We have all of these beautiful children. We become pastors. All these crazy things happen, but I would not have known that if I allowed Jacob to speak up for everything in my life. You cannot allow Jacob to rule. You cannot allow Jacob to reign because if you allow Jacob to rule, you allow Jacob to reign, Israel will never come forth. Israel is birthed in the most difficult of situations. Israel is birthed when we're tired, when we're worn out when we don't feel like we're going to make it, when we're ready to call it quits. If you're in that position, I'm telling you, please don't give up, don't give up, don't give up. Whatever you do, don't give up. You're on the brink of giving birth to Israel. And I promise you, when you see Israel, you're going to forget all the mess of Jacob. Because there's restoration in Israel. There's redemption in Israel. There's joy in Israel. God wants to get you to your Israel. Just make sure that Jacob don't make you quit before you get there. I need you to know that God has the absolute best in store for you. It was never his intent for you to be named in the way that you were. It was never his intent for you to walk around and be known as the girl who got raped. It was never his intent for you to be known as the boy with the drug dealer father. It was never his intent for you to go around with these monikers that, that make you feel some type of way and make you feel horrible. That was the enemy before, before, before you were even thought of. God always wished, desired, and wanted you to be whole, lacking nothing. Behold the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you, to give you a hope and a future and an expected end. I need you to know that it was always in the plan. You just have to make sure that Jacob doesn't cancel it out. Stand to your feet. What I want to do is I want to pray for us. Because like I told you, what happened is Jacob, Jacob became Israel. But there were instances that Jacob showed back up. And I don't know about you, but I've been in a position where my flesh tried to show up. And, and my, when my flesh tried to show up, it tried to show out. Because it had been lying dormant for a long time. You tie up a dog for a long time and let it loose, what happened? He's not like, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> that dude start moving, right? Running around the whole yard. That, that's how your flesh is. And I'd be lying to you if I did not say that we do not all have instances where that twin, that evil twin, wants to show up and clown and act a fool. But I need you to know this. If that twin, if Jacob has shown up in your life, baby, there's forgiveness. Yeah. This is this, I just keep feeling, I need you to know. You, there's nowhere that is too far for God to reach you. You cannot go, you cannot go too far. I, I worry for our culture as millennials because we have gotten to the point we have allowed our actions to identify who we are. We have allowed our bodies to tell us what we will and will not do. And we don't subject ourselves to the spirit. And in so doing, Israel never comes to life. And we glorify and we exalt Jacob. And Israel is in agony. Because all Israel wants to do is show you who you really are. I need you to know another thing. This is not by might, nor by power, but by his spirit. The angel of God touches Jacob's hip, which is right by his thigh, if you didn't know that. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. That's obvious, right? <laughs> Sorry, had a moment. Right by his thigh. And I always used to wonder growing up in church, why, why that area? That doesn't make any sense, Lord. Why, why you got to mess with my hips, God? 
And, and what, I, what I discovered in research is that um, in, in this particular tradition, this Jewish tradition, they would carry their knives here in the hollow of their thigh area. And so this is, if somebody came up on them to attack them, they would pull out this knife and go for it and kill and slaughter. And, and so once he names him Israel, he also makes a point to touch his hip, to touch his socket, the place where he would keep his weapon, where he would do the battle and then the fighting because, you know, he's been wrestling his whole life. And God makes a point to touch right there because he needed him to know, I know you've been fighting your whole life, but I take over from here. And you don't have to fight anymore. And what I need you to know is that God is fighting for you. God is wild about you. You are not doing this by yourself. I know it's hard. I know you're struggling. You're not alone. It's not by might. It's not by power, but by his spirit. And I believe that God is giving you the strength necessary to fight the battles, the Jacobs, the demons, the heartaches that you're fighting. But I need you to know it's not in your strength, but it's in his and so what I want to do in this moment is pray for us. I told y'all, this message isn't just for you, it's for us. So I want to pray for us. And if you feel like, man, I've really been struggling with this Jacob, Pastor. Like, that, that was me for real. Or if you're saying, you know, I'm Israel, I, God has redeemed me, but Jacob keep creeping up, and I don't want to fall. I don't want to mess up. God, I, I'm so close, but, but I keep feeling that flesh rising up again, and I'm, try, I'm trying. I promise I'm trying not to sleep with old girl, but she be keep coming around. I, I promise, I promise I'm trying to leave that boy alone, but he was looking really good yesterday, God, and I'm trying to keep it safe, and, and I don't want to mess up, and I don't want to get the guilt because, see, sin is entices you, but it never tells you about the consequences, and the consequences are always death. It's always guilt. You never feel good about it, and he wants to condemn you and make you feel like you're horrible, and that's not God's intent. So if that's you, I don't care if it's one of you in this room, but God sent me here to talk to somebody, some Jacob, some Israel. I don't care if it's one of you. I want you to meet me down here at this altar, and I want to pray with you. I want to pray for you. I need you to see that you are not by yourself, that not only not only is God fighting for you, but there are an army of young people who are all around you who are fighting the same battle, who are fighting the same fight. I'm telling you, you can do it. You can make it. You can overcome. Don't abort Israel before he gets a chance to live. Don't make Jacob make you do something you don't want to do. And don't let Jacob dictate your life. You are not Jacob. You are Israel. You are an overcomer. You are not your actions. Don't let the devil make you feel. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. When Jesus died on the cross, he did not see your sin and hop off and say, I, 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 I'll die for everything except for that sight. He wasn't playing double dutch. He stayed on that thing. He, he knew, he knew your dirt. He died for you anyway. He knew your struggle. He died for you anyway. He knew you were having a hard time. He died for you anyway. It's because he saw Israel. He saw who you were. He saw who you could be. And I promise you, I'm looking down right now, and I see you. I feel you, bruh, I am you. I need you to know that God is no respecter of persons. If he can do it for me, he can do it for you. Don't take your life. Don't allow Jacob to make you do something crazy. I need you to know there is restoration, there is healing, there is deliverance for you, and God by his spirit will give you the strength to fight off that flesh. It's not easy, and it's also not singular. It's something you got to do every day. People work out. They talk about no days off. No days off. No days off. No days off. Every single day. And let me tell you what I love about this church, man. It's so, like, it's us, y'all. 
This, this is our generation, yo. And our, our, our generation is out here struggling. And they don't need something perfect. They need us. They need our stories. God knew who he, we were when he called us. And so he'll redeem even the mess of your past and your present and use it for his glory. All things work together for the good of those who love God and are be called according to his purpose, even your mess. So if you would, raise your hands. Raise your hands with me real quick. And I just want to pray with you. God, God, I pray for us. For every single person down at this altar, for even those at their seat, God, who are struggling, God, those of us who are in this room who are saying, God, I've allowed Jacob to rule. I've let him run my life. I let him do whatever he wants to do. And I've been wrestling and wrestling and wrestling and wrestling with everything except taking the time to actually have an encounter with you, God. And I'm ready now more than ever before in my life to have you take over. God, I've been trying in my own strength. I've been trying myself, God. And I recognize that without you, I can't do this. So, God, I'm asking you right now, God, to give me the strength that I need. God, to give me what I need. God, you said it's your anointing that breaks the yoke. So God, I pray for your anointing to hit this place hard and heavy. Your deliverance to hit this place hard and heavy. God, that people would leave this place changed and never again the same in Jesus' name. God, for those who are Israel's in this room at this altar right now, who are still struggling with that Jacob, who feel that flesh rising, God, I thank you that you remind them that they are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. God, that you have already given them victory, that you have already give them authority, that you've already delivered them, that you've already set them free. God, I pray, God, that as they're going out of these doors, as they prepare to leave, God, that you walk with them. God, that you be with them. God, that you help them to keep the faith. God, that you help them, God, not to give up, not to give in. God, I come against spirits of depression, spirits of suicide, spirits of anxiety. I say you have no place. You are conquered. You have been overcome by the blood of the Lamb. I thank you, God, that you give them peace, which passes with all understanding, peace in their minds, peace in their hearts. May it guard them all the days of their life. God, I thank you, God, that you overshadow them with your love even now. God, overshadow them even right now, God. Let your wings spread, God, and may you sing over them with your love, God, because you love them with a love that is everlasting, God. God, as we begin to conquer, God, these twins that live on the inside of us, let us be reminded, God, that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. May we decrease and may you increase. 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 May we decrease and may you increase in us, God. Increase in us, oh God. And we believe it and receive it even right now in the name of Jesus. Now I want you to do something. I want you to grab the hands of everyone around you. Because I need you to know that you're not by yourself. I feel like one of the biggest lies the enemy tells our generation is that it's just you. You're the only one in church struggling like this. Nobody else is having this problem but you. This is you over in the corner struggling. No, you are not by yourself. You are not by yourself. There are more who are for you than are against you. And you are already before creation. This is, this is a fixed fight. You are going to win. I don't think you understand that. You are going to win. If you don't quit, you're going to win. God, I thank you, God, that you give us the strength to stand. Having done all to stand, let us stand. Recognizing, God, that we've already won, God, because you overcome. I thank you, God, finally, God, that you said that they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. I thank you, God, that there are testimonies in this room that are birthing the miraculous in this city, that are birthing books, that are birthing movies, that are birthing movements, 
that are birthing things in the spiritual realm that are going to break chains, that are going to break shackles, that are going to break generational curses and bondages that have been seen for years. God, I thank you and I receive by faith the victory in the name of Jesus. I thank you for the testimonies of your faithfulness, the testimonies of your deliverance, the testimonies of your goodness, the testimonies of your faithfulness, God. I thank you, God, 